I think one more time with all we have, great is the Lord. Can we just declare that all over the room one more time today? I've come to bless his name. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise. Now, let's get real biblical today. Can we get real biblical? The scripture in Psalms 150 says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Are you ready on the count of three? That means everyone that has breath, that means you. You're part of the choir. You're part of the worship team. I want you to declare his praise real strong and real loud today. One, two, three. Praise. Pretty good. I think we could do a little better. Are you ready? One, two, three. Praise the Lord. Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So good seeing you today. Always privileged to celebrate and cherish these summer months together. I heard Talon say it and Abby say it. I want to just say this real quickly too. I believe it's imperative and it is important and we may be um, on the verge, and I don't want to get too strong at the inset, uh, on the onset, but we, we may be on the verge of falling into um, a lukewarm state if we come here without expectation and believing. If we just come here like this is Costco or, in, or you're playing, if we just come into this, this is supernatural here. This is unlike anything else in the world. And if we don't come with a sense of expectation and faith that I'm going to hear from God, that God's going to move and the Spirit of God is here, then we really diminish the experience here. So we need to let our faith come alive in a great way. Amen? Can we do that? As was mentioned, we have about 12 amazing youth leaders and 30 plus kids at camp and they're having a wonderful time. They come back on Monday. I still don't know if I like them not being in church on Sunday. I'll have to... I don't know who I call and <laughs> gripe and complain about. I'm just kidding. But we're so thrilled and so thankful about that. It's a great day. I can't wait to share the word. But tomorrow is a special day. And I just want to say happy anniversary to my wife, Abby. 23 years tomorrow. We're babies. <laughs> Isn't that wild? <laughs> yeah, tomorrow we celebrate 23 years. So... If you let me out alive today, we'll celebrate tomorrow. If not, I love you. The Lord can bless you and keep you. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm um, really excited about um, the word today. And I think what I want to do is conclude this. This will be part six of our Success God's Way series. And then next week I have a real clear, really felt like God uh, visited me on a Tuesday morning with a really strong word that's in me. And I can't wait to share it next week on Jesus as the healer on how he turns bitter water sweet. So don't forget that next week. But I want to conclude uh, the series, Success God's Way, in a way that I feel is absolutely imperative. If you have your Bibles, would you open them up to Acts chapter, Acts chapter 20, please. Acts chapter 20, verse 35 today. I want to speak on the subtitle, Why I Live to Give. Why I Live to Give. And believe that after we're done today, you will be so impacted that you too will live to give. That will be a mantra. That will be a focal point of your life um, because it transforms us. I really feel today is a very pivotal and powerful message that is a linchpin. It is a linchpin to your life in God and to what he wants to do. Uh, I love you, and I am your pastor. He's the Lord. He's our shepherd, but I love you. And I really feel the emphasis on today is a strategic wisdom of God for where you are and for where we're going. Amen? In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, let me give you the context. 
Paul, who navigated three major missionary journeys. He had a ministry team and a party. They just come from Troas. They find themselves in Miletus, and they're just about to go to Tyre. Right before he sails to a different city, he has a meeting, and he asks for the leaders of Ephesus to gather And the Apostle Paul speaks to the leaders of that great church, and he gives them an instruction. It's like his farewell. I believe Paul thought he'll never see them again. It was his last face-to-face meeting with these influential leaders in Ephesus who would carry on the gospel. Please note this. Acts 20, 35 contains... Outside of the four Gospels, the only quoted quote of Jesus in all the New Testament. Acts 20, 35, outside of the four Gospels, is the only, only quoted quote Jesus said in the New Testament. It's powerful. It's huge. It's a big deal. And without this, we stay stuck and stagnant in our lives. You don't want to stay stuck. You don't want to stay stagnant, and without this, we all suffer and stay stuck and stagnant in our spiritual lives. I've shown you in every way by laboring like this, Paul, that you must support the weak, and whatever you do, remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Remember the words of Jesus. He said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I want to support that with Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. There is one who scatters and he increases more. There is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Holy Spirit, what will we do without you? Our teacher, our helper, our guide. Would you anoint me in the most unprecedented way to articulate your heart that these people would soar to a new realm and to a new love. I'm here to serve you and to serve these people, to elevate them into a new realm and the will and plan of you. And so I pray today, a tangible anointing that will transcend our lives. We give you all the praise. We hold your word dear and near, your word above your name. Teach us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you're not too caught off by the title, Why I Live to Give. It's a little bit of a bait because my whole intention today is not that I would live to give, but that you would live to give. Why I live to give and why I today humbly suggest, submit, and present to you as a believer, as a born-again, spirit-filled believer who loves Jesus and desires to live his will and plan out. I suggest to you that it is the will of God and a hundred percent of success God's way that you live a life to give. Giving is truly the best. If anyone's had the privilege to give and to be used by God in a blessing, you know it's in a class all by itself. Hands down. It's not up for debate. I'll debate anybody. Giving is contagious. It's so fun. It's an honor and it's transformational. And to be used by God as a giver is such a humbling experience. Wow. I have the assignment today, the burden, the burden I feel. I want to highlight, I want to emphasize the sheer beauty and wonder of giving. I don't know what your thought and your concept is, but maybe your mind needs to be renewed because it is absolutely glorious and beautiful and it's so spiritual and so supernatural. Giving is supreme. It is absolutely supreme and whether you like this message or not, when you leave today, you will realize receiving is not supreme, but giving is supreme. What? Wow. I don't know if this is cool anymore, but OMG, we get to be givers? 
Is that true? Yeah. Like, whoa, we get to partner with, whoa, we get to be a part of God's plan and be givers. Wow. The gift of giving. The gift is giving. Giving is the gift. Giving and living a life as a giver is an incredible gift. It's not just natural, no, it's supernatural and spiritual in nature. And the act and action of giving impacts people unlike anything else, unlike anything else. No doubt we've been in a series, Success God's Way. I'm hoping it's helping in some ways, but there's no doubt 100% of Success God's Way is to be a giver. No doubt, no questions about it. To live a life of generosity, a life where you are blessed to be a blessing. The Lord Jesus Christ himself set the example and set it all in motion. I love this verse. I want to live by this verse. I want to reference it often. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. Listen to this. For the love of Christ compels us. Everything we do is because we're compelled first by his love. By his his love compels me and compels you. Don't you want to be compelled, moved by the love of him? Because we judge this, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but should live for him who died and rose again. That is the sweet spot, friend. Wherever you are at every age, it is so powerful when you get delivered from yourself and you begin to live a life to give a life of what he's done. And he set that in perpetual motion for all of us. The Lord is the supreme, perfect, most complete example of giving. He died for all, that those who live no longer have to live for themselves. You, I, we, are most like God when we give. You and I are most like the action, the nature, and the image of God when we're in the posture of giving. It's true. I'm walking in his divine likeness and image the most when I'm at the highest level of love. And the highest level of love is not receiving. The highest level of love is giving. For God so loved the world. Hear me, don't miss this. The highest level of love is not receiving. The highest level of love is giving. For God so loved the world that he gave. You and I are most like God when we are giving what God has given us. I want to function and operate like my father. I want to bear his image. I want to resemble his nature and character. You're in the image of him, don't you? Our whole lives are called to Jesus to be co-laborers. You know that? We're co-laborers with him. We're working with him in the earth. This is not a one-time thing. It's, it's, we're, we're, we're co-laborers with him. When you give, it's not your nature because your nature is not to give. When you give, you know you've transcended your nature and you're operating in the nature of God because only God's nature is a nature to give. Our nature is a nature to get. God's nature is a nature to give. And when you feel that giving flow, you know you've transcended natural and you've tapped into the nature of Christ at work inside of you. Giving is something that everyone can do and everyone's called to. Love looks like something and someone. In Ephesians 5, it says, therefore, be imitators of God as children. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a sweet smelling aroma. So God who has given us all things, everything, because God has past ten tense given, we have everything. Everything God has given, and now we have what we have. And then God has gave. He gave his son 
to be the sacrificial lamb for all hum- humanity, purchasing, redeeming our eternal salvation. And God continually gives, always and continually, past tense, present tense, and future tense. It's impossible to separate God from giving. He lives in the continual posture of giving. Even every day, you have new mercies because he's continually giving to us. Everything we have and possess is only because God is a giver and because he continually gives. There's nothing you have without his generosity that's limitless toward us. David really had this revelation and concept after he gave the largest offering. He said, riches and honor come from you. You reign above all. In your hand is the power and ability to make great. You give me strength. Now, therefore, we thank you and we praise you. But who am I and who are my people that we can give back to you? Wow, because you've given, now I have received and now I can engage with you in this life of giving willingly. For all things come from you. So in all our giving, our giving, it does include, and I got to teach this, a sacrifice. Giving is a sacrifice. And it is an offering. That sacrifice and that offering to God is a sweet smelling aroma. We can't miss that in scripture. So every time I'm giving, don't, don't, don't find the illusion of this. There is a sacrifice to it. God loves the sacrifice. And there is an offering to it. But to God, it says, to God it is a sweet smelling aroma. When you look at that word in the Greek, it actually means to bring God a fragrance of refreshing. To create an aroma. Abby loves candles. And she'll light candles around the home to create an atmosphere. And sometimes I'm discerning, I can say, oh, a new scent. And she'll, like, hide and seek, wanted me to find the new scent. You know, like, what is it today? You know, pina colada. I mean, what's the, what's the flow? Well, that, that candle sets off an aroma of an atmosphere. The scripture says that you, through your giving, have the ability to create to God a refreshing fragrance, an aroma that to him is beautiful and sweet. My giving, your giving, is a sacrifice that's sweet. In Hebrews 7, 7 and 8, in the context of all this, it elaborates on this idea. And verse 7 says, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Let me just, uh, just help you with something. We are the lesser, and God is the better. Who's blessed by who? The lesser is blessed by the greater. So stay connected to the greater. Stay in the economy of the greater. And then it says something that is so profound, and I don't want to get into the debate of the details of this, but it says, here mortal men receive tithes, receive giving. But it doesn't stop there. But there he receives them of whom is witness that he lives. Your giving isn't just a natural, normal thing. Do you know that your giving actually is directly to the heavenly high priest, the king, the Lord Jesus? When you give to man, or you're actually not giving to man. You're giving directly to the Lord. Our financial support, our stewardship of the gospel, of the kingdom of God, touches the heart of God unlike anything else. Jesus had the audacity to teach, and in Mark 9, 41, he said, for whoever gives a cup of water, the insignificance of a cup of water, there is no significance of a cup of water, but whoever gives a cup of water in my name, he says, does it? You got to get that, church. He's down to the cup of water you give in his name. And he says, you don't do it to who you gave it to. You do it to me. You're actually honoring me with a cup. Whatever you steward in my name, releasing it, you do it unto me. In Acts chapter 10, God shifted the entire church and the whole mindset of even the early apostles, Peter, 
through a man who was not in the team. He hadn't been to Bible school yet. He wasn't on the staff. He wasn't on the payroll. He was a man by the name of Cornelius. And he is used by God to actually shift the entire ministry and mindset of Peter. And this man we know of in Acts 10, all he did, just just a good man, he was a centurion man of an Italian regiment, but he was a, a devout man, look at this, who feared God with his household, and here's what he did. He would give alms generously, and he would pray. We can do that. Cornelius, an Italian regiment, a good man, a good guy, and this is how he led his home. He led his home with generosity, and he would pray. And what the Bible says about that man, it says that, um, so the Lord said, your prayers and your arms have now built a statue of a memorial. God built a statue and a memorial based upon Cornelius' generosity and giving. You ever been to a, an arena and you see the, the different statues of different things? The memorials of different things? You've been to 9-11. I had to, the privilege to go to 9-11. And you see, those are built and established so we never forget. God says because of Cornelius' giving and prayers in the spirit realm, there's a statue of remembrance of what he's done. Don't you think what you do for Jesus matters? Don't you think what you do for Jesus carries eternal weight? He had a memorial built based upon his service of God. And then you read on, and he was used by God with a dream to change Peter's whole ministry because he simply was a man of prayer and generosity, and God said, I can do more with that in the church than anything else. I don't know about you, but I want to live a life of giving that God can build some remembrances of the Pollock family and use our life in an incredible way. Giving is the divine exchange and transaction that God requires on earth from heaven. I want to say that again. I want to be very methodical and teach today. Giving is the divine exchange and transaction that God requires on earth from heaven. Our release to receive, the seed, the time, the harvest. Giving is the act and the action that leads you to what's next, to the more, to the new. Without giving, you will stay stuck and stagnant in every area of your life. Relationships will stay stuck, Your spiritual life will stay stuck and everything you have will stay stuck without the release of giving because you'll never go to what's new and you'll never go to what's next. Here it is. Acts 20, 35, it's red letter, the words of Jesus. I would assume, I would assume that if the text is correct and as Peter is instructing those Ephesian leaders, he would say this, and remember, In my humble opinion, we don't have it in the Gospels, but Jesus, a leader, is a repeater. I would assume possibly every day or once a week after every miracle, Jesus would call the boys together and say, remember guys, it's better to give than to, they had a mantra, it was like their tattoo, it was their slogan, they knew it. That was their, they knew that. He would, that was how he endorsed his email, that was his signature, remember, 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 it's better to give than to receive. Remember, it's more blessed. So I would assume Jesus had that on repeat to where now it's echoing in Acts 20. Paul wasn't part of the team, but that echoed. Everyone would say that all the time. If you're a believer, you know it's better. It's better. When you give your tip, you say it. When you honor, this is how they lived. As a believer, as the society of Christ, you know, I know. Remember, boys. Remember, we're living a sacrificial life. Remember, it's more blessed to give. So now we're years out, years out, and they're still saying, remember what Jesus told us. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And you and I know as humans that goes completely contrary to everything of our nature. Because we would flip that. It's more blessed to receive. I didn't mean to get so passionate. 
I'm going to save myself. Simmer down, preacher. I teach and I preach, and then I yell. It's a unique calling. It's a teaching, <laughs> preaching, shouting ministry. Few have the shouting. I teach, I preach, <laughs> and then I got to simmer down. It's echoing. We got to look at this for just a moment, and can we siphon some stuff from this? Because this is just transformational. So from God, this is not from man. It's not man's perspective. This is not in education. It's not university. You're not going to find this in the human books of wisdom. This is not, this is not philosophy. This is not Plato. This is not Einstein. This is not Elon Musk. This is nothing of human. That, that stuff, this is a different realm. We've tapped into the intelligence of God. This is a different level. This is supernatural. This is not earthly wisdom. This is not get all you can, can all you get. Get all you can, can all you get. Get all you can, can all you get. Get natural. This is unlike any. This is the mind of God. This is the creator of heaven and earth. This is God's wisdom speaking to us about how to live a life and not stay stuck and stand, but tap into a new realm. This is God's wisdom. This supersedes the wisdom of man. So from God, from the Lord, what's the most successful way? Who's the most successful one in the room? Who's the one that's successful? The receiver or the giver? Let's be honest. In this room, you know, last Sunday, I think 555 people on campus, five, five. five, in, In this room and online, at the sound of my voice, Who's the most successful, elite person in the room? The one receiving? No. The one giving. More blessed is a phrase that earmarks, denotes something in a much greater and superior level far beyond. Better and greater in value greater in impact, and greater and superior in fruitfulness. Greater, better, due to the fact that it, watch this, prepares and positions you for what God has. You turn the faucet on, you open the door, because your giving positions you for what he has. So it opens the door and prepares you for what he wants to do. Giving being a giver, or what I say to you, living to give, is what creates and generates a higher level of fulfillment. So the essence of what Jesus is saying here is the more fulfilled person isn't the receiver. The most fulfilled person is the giver because a life of giving is the most fulfilled life you can have. Let me stay there for just a moment. We think the most fulfilled person is the one who keeps receiving. No. He's actually articulating a place in the spirit and in your soul of life. You're most fulfilled in me when you become a giver. How many want to be fulfilled in life? All three of us. I know that's exactly why I'm teaching this message. We can maybe get five for service. How many, don't you want to live a life fulfilled? Jesus says the only way to be fulfilled is to live a life of giving. I'm going to start paying for amens today. I think I have a little cash on me. The giver is more happy than the receiver. A giver elevates their life and everyone attached to it. If you live around a giver, you are the benefactor of them elevating your world. So the chief, this is heavy. You may want to take out your phones as I teach today. The chief characteristic and attribute ascribed to the society of those following Jesus must be generosity. I don't want to get, we're already deep. I'm already on your toes and you're probably saying, when can I go? (laughs) Doors are locked. You can't leave. We're stuck here forever. We've got a friend from Texas back. Love you, Danny. You can't leave, guys. There's nowhere else to go. There's no doubt. If you go from Genesis to Revelation, wherever you want to look, the only way to really articulate a believer in Jesus is following the trace of generosity. There's a flow. There's a flow. 
of those following must be they must be known among men as givers rather than judges. We've all been judges, haven't we? We're all good judges, huh? Oh, let's, let's just retire from being judges. But boundless generosity, limitless kindness to all, saint and sinner. That's what he, the master, would press upon those who would follow his leading. So, hey, do you want to be part of my, you want to, you want to be my disciple? Here's what he would impress. On our team, we are Generous. Oh, I can't do that, sir. Tap out. But we, as my followers in our camp, we live by this premise. Generous in your words and generous in your heart and generous with you. We're going to have, there's going to be a flow. I should close my eyes and follow generosity and find a believer. I should be able to follow a flow, a river. Because that's the society of those who love Jesus. Now, now Proverbs 11 uh, at its face value, it, it kind of takes some of it off the sovereignty of God, which he is sovereign, but he, it challenges you in a place of participation. So he, he compares and contrasts two ways to live, okay? Male, female, young or old. There is one who scatters. And it doesn't go bad for them. They increase more. What a concept. That's not a lottery ticket. That's not good fortune. That's not luck. It's the flow of God's kingdom. We sow and we scatter. And then there's one who withholds. So in all of us, we've got scatterers and we've got withholders. <laughs> More than is right because you have to be good stewards. But it's not right not to give. That's not wisdom. It's not wisdom to navigate the wind and the air, as Ecclesiastic says, and navigate the, the economy and say, oh, I better withhold. No, because you're doing yourself a disservice and all those around you, because it's not right to withhold if God says that part is to be given. So one who scatters, one who withholds, but it leads to poverty. But the generous soul will be made rich, and the one who waters others Who'll be with, you'll never go without. You'll never have a drought. You want to know how you can live without a drought or without a famine? So I look at that and go, that's not just on God. That's on us. Amen. That's a bit on me. Because if I'm not going to water anybody, if I'm not going to be a giver, I'm going to lead and my life's going to get smaller. Do you, do you want a small life? You don't want a small, small life. You want a big life. You want to, you determine the landscape of your life based upon the generosity. It's easy for us though in times to look what we just want. But it's powerful when you look what you can do for others. In the Lord's Great Commission, Matthew 28, Luke 12, John 17, Acts 1, the Lord's Commission to the apostles and to us, as he instructs them, he says this, and these signs shall follow those who believe. Don't you want to have signs a part of your life? Yes. That's identify. Yeah. So in my name, they'll cast out demons, they'll speak with new tongues. There's signs that identify. Do you know that speaking in tongues is so powerful? It was the first done in the Old Testament under Moses' ministry. It's done in the Old Testament and the New. There's signs. Can I suggest to you one of the most powerful signs coming from a believer is the sign of generosity. That's a sign and a wonder. You know why? You know why? Because my giving is a sign that generates wonders and miracles for others. Every time I give and live to give, it's a sign that creates wonders and miracles all around us. Giving is just so supernatural. Earlier on, Jesus commissioned the disciples to go out two by two. And he told them how to go. If, if no one receives you, dust the peace off, go somewhere else. He instructed them. And he first told them, don't take anything for provision. You're going to learn how to live by faith. Don't take a knapsack. Don't take anything. Go in two. If they don't receive you, dust the, don't give them your peace. Move on. But then he says this, heal the sick, pray. And then he says this, freely, freely you have received, freely give. You, Freely, freely, freely. I've given you salvation, everything you got freely, but you need to then freely you have received. Freely. 
So you can cut that kink real quick. It's all, if all you have is freely you've received, but there's no freely giving. So if I have and you have received from him, which we have, then it should be that flow. <laughs> when you really think about it, let's get smart. Really, let's, let's get intelligent. Let's just become really good, smart, educated people. When you really think about and consider giving at its face value. So today, I'm not because Abby get upset, but I used to, I'm going to give some of my watch, okay? And you wouldn't want it because it's so, you, I would not give you this because it's a mess. You know, I wouldn't want to give you something I don't want because that's not giving. Giving isn't what you don't want. Giving is what you value. Amen? But if I were to give, give my watch today to you or whatever, well, man, I, I'd go without this. I'd miss it. I'd think about it. I'd have buyer's remorse. <laughs> you ever done like you just, oh my gosh, what did I just do? Why did I do that? Well, when you give something, it actually encompasses and exercises every act and action of godliness. Think about giving. Obedience, check. When I give faith, check. Humility, check. Sacrifice, check. Trust, check. Love, check. Loving your neighbor as yourself, check. The golden rule, do unto others as you want them to do unto you, check. Generosity, Kindness, serving, worship, discipline. I mean, in your giving is everything exercise that God desires. All of it. The Bible points out a real beautiful thing. That God himself actually loves cheerful givers. It does. God loves cheerful givers. He says, let each one of you give as you purpose in his own heart, not grudgingly or of a necessity. Because God loves a cheerful giver. What a statement. Like, what does that mean? What's the fullness of that? It actually means that God has a unique and special affection for givers. God plays no favorites. There is no favoritism with him, nor Jew, Gentile, male or female. But in God's heart, givers have a unique place in him. That's what it means. God loves givers. They're unique to him. I don't know, maybe special treatment. I don't know, maybe VIP. I don't know. In God, it says, I love cheerful givers. It means that there's a place in his will and his plan that when one chooses willingly and happily to live a life of generosity and giving, God has a unique affection for that person. Giving positions and allows God to move in your life. You know why I think God loves a cheerful giver? Because it allows God to move in your life in a greater way. Because as a father, without it, there's a hindrance. But with it, God can enter in and do things that nothing else can take place. When we open the door, when we turn on the faucet, when we let things flow in that way, it's so powerful. Cheerful in the Greek means a hilarious giver. Someone who is so enthusiastic and thrilled to give. Meaning our giving should be the greatest, most special, celebrate. Oh my gosh, oh my, it's this special, sacred moment. God loves a hilarious, enthusiastic giver. Not grudging, not obligation, not religious, not, no. Oh my gosh, the miracle of giving. Woo! And sometimes, especially in this generation, how far we've come, because let's be honest, we typically think what I can get. You've probably viewed this church and view me. He better have a word today because he's given me 52 He's given me a lot. But if he doesn't have something for me today, I'm here based upon what I can, I can get. 
And if you can't keep giving me something, I'm going to find a new crew because I've got to keep getting something. Wow. Maybe God's saying you're mature enough now to not think about just you, but to come here and go, how can I, I'm going to pray for my pastor on Saturday, and I'm going to invite somebody on Sunday, and I'm going to come into this place and not think just about. Yes. Maybe we're at a mature level to say, oh, it's not just about. God loves, he, it's in the Bible, he celebrates, that's a moment, wow. To the point, and, and, and to the point, and this is not religious, we see in the Gospels, Jesus at the temple sitting, can you bring me an offering bucket real quick please, dad, dad, just throw it up here, I'll catch it. You know, he didn't trust me, I don't trust you either. <laughs> So if you were going to the temple in Jesus' day and you had to, because you couldn't enter in without something, Old or New Testament, uh, he, he was sitting right here and he literally is watching ev everybody. He, <clears throat> and there's a widow with two mites. And Jesus says, this little woman gave more than you big bucks, big pockets, tipping God. He sees your off. He, and he, Jesus says, I want to just tell everybody in the room, you didn't even give sacrificial, you didn't even feel it because you could. But what this woman did as a widow, she gave something that's special. And this woman, widow, gave. But, but, but he said that because he was watching how everyone. So do you think he sees when you skirt it? When you don't? When he says you better give that, and you're like, what? Well, have you seen the economy? <laughs> I just want to say, Jesus, I don't. I, I don't. I can't get caught in that because, well, I want to pastor you for another week, you know? Honestly, honestly. I got to save my heart. I got to pastor you by the Spirit. But Jesus, He watches everything you do. And says, so, oh, you know better. And you're still, why would you cheat me when I give you everything? Why would you, why would you rob from me because you rob from, th this is what I felt the Holy Spirit told me in giving. If you rob from God, you steal from yourself. If you rob from God, you're stealing from yourself and from your family and from your, you're stealing from yourself. You're harming yourself. You're dangering. It's getting hot in here. Aren't you thankful you have a pastor who loves you and wants to teach you the word? Oh, but pastor, that was like for the, the Bible days. Yeah, these are the Bible days. <laughs> right? I mean, let's just, come on, let the elevator go to the top. But why is it under such attack? Because Satan wants to attack major things in your life. And he knows if he can stop this, he can. Why is there such warfare under this? Because Satan knows if you get a breakthrough here, you can get a breakthrough everywhere. Because Satan knows if you get the mammon broken from your heart and you become free from the biggest demon, mammon, in the land, then you break through from the world system and you tap into the kingdom of God and now you become a partner with God, not with man, and now you've tapped into a supernatural place. Jesus said, one word, give, exchange, sow. And the compound interest of that, Luke 6, 38, I count one thing giving. Seven things happen. Give, I'll, I'll do it for you. It will be given, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, put in your bosom with the same measure you use, it'll be used back to you. One act creates seven Flowed flow. I can't do good measure. I can't. But my giving is a domino that creates a seven-layer flow of God. Listen to me. When you give something, it may leave your hand. It never leaves your life. 
It will never, there's nothing I've ever given or you've given to God. It may leave your moment. It has not left your life or your legacy. There is no doubt that this church and this family is a product because people have given. It leaves your moment, but it will not leave your life. You give and God responds with sevenfold dimension. Give and it shall be given. Giving is one of the wisest and smartest things you can do. In the context of God loving a cheerful giver, giver, um, we would stop a bit premature if we didn't continue the text. Because God loves a cheerful giver and God does great things, but that's not the conclusion of it because verse 8 is where we get to. And verse 8 says, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. So right after God says he loves a cheerful giver, the next verse says this about God. And God, say God, God. the Lord. And he will make all grace abound towards you, that you have sufficiency in all things and abundance for every good work. And God will cause all grace to abound towards you, that you having sufficiency in all things have an abundance for every Now, let me stop here. That is not talking and referring to spiritual graces. God has, that's not referring, don't get spiritual on that. It's not referring to spiritual graces. In context, there's no question it's referring to the need you have of monetary thing. God says, if you partner with me, I will cause you to miss nothing. I will cause, I'm not talking spiritual graces of joy, of revelation, of even dream. I will enter in and I will bring monetary breakthrough to your life. The direct money and material things you need will be a result. Abby said it in the offering and we didn't talk about it, but the verse before what she said, it says that when you give, you make friends for yourself through money. And when that money fails, you receive them into eternity. Your giving is not just temporary, it's eternal. And through your giving, you're making eternal friends. You'll be in heaven. And because you were faithful with mammon, people will say, thank you because you gave to the gospel and support the gospel. I'm in heaven because of your obedience. Now I'm an eternal friend because you were faithful and unrighteous mammon. God used it because giving is eternal. And it's that powerful. My giving connects me to God's economy. I'm gonna end here. I may finish this second service. So we live to give and not living to get. The direct opposite We live to give, not living to get. In Proverbs 30, 15, it says, the leech has two daughters crying out. The the message Bible says these leeches are crying out. And here's what they say. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more. There are three things that are never never, never satisfied. What's a leech? I hate mosquitoes the most. I mean, I, I like, I really, I have no understanding why God would make a mosquito. I, this is, to me, I don't even understand. I mean, it is unbelievable that you can't sit outside in a beautiful Southern California weather and just enjoy a dog walk without being attacked by these. What, what purpose do they have? What destiny? They have? Oh, I know, to crucify my flesh, to keep me in the spirit, and to, it's my cross to bear. Just labor, just carry my cross because... I mean, what in the world? But the second thing underneath that is a leech. Do you know what a leech? A leech. Do you know that a leech is classified as a predatory worm? It's a horse leech. It's a bloodsucker. It's, it's, it is an aquatic terrestrial blood-sucking parasite that sucks from both ends. It's got two mouths. Not just one mouth. It's got two. And you know what God's saying? There are a bunch of people that all they are they're predatory in nature. All they're saying is, let me suck the blood out. Give it to me. When you're not a giver, you become a predator and you suck the life out of relationships, the life out of the church, and the life out of God's plan. 
I submit to you, you should live a life to give, not a life to get. Because if not, all we are is leeches and we want more and more and more and we're sucking blood. Life's in the blood. And you can cause even a ministry and a family to go down if you're in it for its own. Give me, give me, give me. Well, that's what Judah says. Well, that's what kids say. But not, um, <laughs> I shouldn't look at some of the dads and they used to have seen their faces. He's like, say that again, preacher. I'll give you $10. Say that to my kids. I came, I drove all the way 30 minutes for the preacher to say that to my kids today. Because a leech lives entirely off of the blood from somebody else. And they don't stop sucking because they go to the other side to suck. Now, it's not even referring to leeches, it's referring to people. It's actually referring to people. Jesus calls them harlots, they're hirelings. They just want to come in and benefit from the sheep. They don't want to be a part of it. They don't want to co-labor with it. They don't want to freely receive, freely we give. We're hirelings. Actually, it's talking about people who are never satisfied, never give back, and only want more. You know, you won't be able to stay at a church very long as if you are just a leech. Yeah. Because we'll never be able to do it. I'll never be able to. It's just, can't do it. Like, I can't do it. I can't do it. You can't. You'll always. Until you settle in. You become part of a body. And you realize freely I have. Wow. Now let me partner and give. Church. Body of Christ. America. Consumer America, consumers, remember the words of Jesus. It is much better, more fulfilling, more powerful to be a giver than to be a receiver. Because when you give, you release heaven on earth. When you give, you let things flow. When you give, you let lives be changed. When you give... Why should you live to give? Well, because in 1 Timothy 6, it's a New Testament commandment. Timothy had to stand up to that big church in Ephesus, man. There were 30,000 people there, they say. And Timothy, as Paul instructed him, said, command the rich, don't be haughty, don't trust in your money, but in the living God. Let them be good rich in giving, ready to give, willing to share. I don't want to share. I don't want to give. We're supposed to live ready to give, willing to share. It's a command. I got to command you. I would not, I wouldn't be up to my pay grade if I didn't command you. Don't trust in this world. Don't trust in this economy. Don't trust in your 401k. Trust in the living God who causes rocks to part and he's the sovereign Lord. Trust in him be willing to give, ready to share. Why should you live to give? Because the whole essence of the Abrahamic blessing is you're blessed to be a, yeah, we're blessed to be a blessing. Why should you live to give? Because unlike your car, your house, your credit score, your job, your gifting, It's eternal. Your giving is eternal. When you sow into the kingdom of God, when you serve and give, it's the only thing that transcends to heaven. Everything else will be burned up. Burned up. House, car, everything. The only thing going with you is what you do in the will of God and what transcends. Jesus said, It's when you're faithful with unrighteous mammon, you'll make eternal friends in heaven. Our giving. I suggest to you as I conclude this series, the conversation doesn't end. Success God's way is to be a hilarious life of a giver. Give honor, give respect, give appreciation, give praise, but don't you stop and spiritualize this. 
because I didn't get specific, but it's not just that. You and I know it's talking about giving what you treasure and what you value. You cannot separate your faith from money, from the currency of heaven. You cannot separate it and spiritualize it. Well, I give my time. Good, but that's not Bible. You're supposed to give in every facet of your life. And God will make all grace abound toward you that you will be sufficient in all things and have an abundance for every good. That, I want to end with that, that verse in 2 Corinthians Paloma, I think like verse 12. And I want to read 12 and 13 after this. It says something that's just really beautiful. For the, let's, would you read this with me? For the, okay, now, now stop. We're in the context of giving. So God's talking about the administration of this service. Not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding. Now, hold, hold on just a moment, because I know there's a lot of thought process out there that says, I just need to give God thanksgiving. Well, I taught that two weeks ago. Yeah, we need to give him thanks, but that's not the only offering. He's talking about the administration of serving and sowing into the kingdom. That brings thanksgiving to God. Now look at verse 13. While through the proof of this ministry, they, who's they? Whoever, the hundred plus kids, that, who, I don't know, who, I don't know, I have no idea. My friend uh, came up to me, my friend in the lobby, and said, Pastor, I just gave your book to my brother. He read the whole thing. And gosh, when you start talking about the sway, I have no idea that for two, I have no idea. I, you don't know what's going to touch, but when you do what God's called you to do, it literally, it literally touches people all over the world that you have no, you will never know what your giving does. You have no idea, but that administration, they glorify God for your confession to the gospel and for your liberally sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you who long for you because of the exchange of the grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable. Let's be a people. I want to live. I want to give more than I get. I want to be at the table and give more than I get. I, I do. I want to be that guy in the room. Lord, we love you today. What a privilege to share your word. And I know that, that these people don't have deaf ears. They have open hearts to follow and to serve and to obey you. We're so thankful that you've called us into partnership with you. It is such a privilege to be a giver be a part of your kingdom come and your will be done. And I thank you that you give us opportunities every day to obey you and to follow you fully. So I thank you that we tuck your word in our hearts, that we follow you fully, and that we serve you in all the ways you've called us to. What a gift to be able to give and to follow you fully. And now I pray over this house and over this people that the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory, you'll cause all grace to abound that we are sufficient in all things and have an abundance for every good work. Amen. Would you put your hands together and thank God for his word. Thank the Lord for his word. Would you stand on your feet today for just a moment as we leave today online and all over the room? I just wonder, have you made the Lord Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Have you committed and submitted your whole life to him? Like you're not born into this thing, you know? I heard someone say the other day, this pastor was telling a story that he met somebody at his church and he said, are you a Christian? They go, yeah, I was born in San Antonio. And he goes, no, no, are you a Christian? He goes, I was born in Texas. No, 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 are you a Christian? Well, I was born into it. No, you're not born into it. You have to, everybody, doesn't matter if my kids aren't saved because their dad's a pastor. They're not saved because of who I am. They have to choose. 
You're not saved because you come to church. You're not saved because even you take communion. You're not saved because you heard a message. That's illusion. You're not born saved. You're born sinful. You have to, at some stage in your life, surrender and call on the Lord and repent for your sins. And this pastor was like, no, they, like for five minutes, I'm from San Antonio. And he goes, who cares? <laughs> have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Like, you're not going to tell her, well, I went to the way. He goes, the way. You, it doesn't matter. You have to accept Jesus and surrender your life to him. I believe we've probably got 25 plus kids doing that at the mountain right now as we speak, having an encounter. It, it became real to me at 19. I had an encounter with Jesus, accepted the Lord, surrendered my life. Church won't get you there. Hearing messages won't get you there. Someone praying for you won't get you there. Knowing someone won't get you there. It is only accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Every eye closed for just a moment. If you have not made the Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I want you to lift up your hand in this room right now. Just lift your hand high. as I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Thank you, Jesus. You may be watching right now. Let's say this. Say, Jesus, today, I surrender my whole life to you. I renounce my past. I repent of my sins, and I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Have your will and way in me. Fill me with your spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the gospel. Praise the Lord. We love you so much. Hang out in the lobby. Enjoy the coffee shop. Tell the people who serve here, thankfully, and I guess Abby said it, if you want to just sign up to be at the picnic, sign up to serve. We'll love to have you there. Can't wait for that. We have prayer partners up here for you. We love you. We'll see you next Sunday, church. Praise the Lord.